What's up, champs? Welcome to Short Shifts, the twice weekly amuse bouche to keep you posted between the eight course meal that is the Keeping Carlson Mega Show each and every Sunday night. I'm your host, Brian Calm, taking Ben Burnett's lines, but I'm so glad to be here stepping in for Lewis, believe it or not, and stepping in for, I mean, you could take it any way you want, but stepping in for, for Ben tonight or the other co-host, I'm joined by a Jeremy Versillo tier one uh, competitor in the past, like a great fantasy hockey mind, very active in our uh, patron community and on our Discord server. This guy knows what he's talking about. He's been on the live draft show before, if anybody listens to our annual tier one auction draft. And uh, he is the uh, West Macaulay's Wrangler slash Keeper, which is a, a bot on our server that does so many amazing things in our little Discord community. So, Jeremy, it's great to have you here to break down all the latest and greatest news in the NHL fantasy landscape that has happened, well, in the last 48 hours since you were on the show with Lewis. Welcome back. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me, Brian. Uh, it's kind of amazing how much has happened in the past 48 hours. I'm like, there's no way there's more content. And yes, there's more content than we had Tuesday, I think. So let's get right into it. Yeah, I feel really fortunate to have a nice, juicy slate of news and actually to plan the show, as I often do, just if everyone's not doing this already, gamedaytweets.com, so good, so good. Like, you could just scroll through the latest uh, the latest tweets from Shams and Elon, uh, basically everything NHL fancy relevant news you need to think about. And, and here Jeremy and I are to sort of take those tweets and break down what they actually mean, starting off with the biggest headline of this, well, today, tonight, the situation has evolved uh, really quickly, actually. Max Pacioretty was uh, taken off the non-roster list or whatever. Then it was like, yeah, he'll be back in about 10 games or so. And then we heard earlier today, Max Pacioretty is playing tonight and uh, it's happening. He's in the lineup. He's wearing a hurricane sweater. This is Pacioretty's first game in Carolina since being acquired in the offseason for, well, basically nothing uh, because Carolina had to do, well, Vegas needed a favor and Carolina stepped up and was like, well, we'll do that for you. We'll take that contract off your hands. And we haven't yet seen what Pacioretty can do in a Canes jersey because he was injured. We found out in the offseason and he was supposed to be out until like mid to late February. and. The, the most recent revision of that was that Pacioretty would still be, again, eight to ten games away. Well, look who's back. And in six minutes of ice time tonight, he's already got three shots. He's playing on a line so far with Derek Stepan and Jesperi Kotkaniemi. And most importantly, it looks like Pacioretty is slotting in on the top power play. So, Jeremy, I mean, I've already, like, there's really not a whole lot of current stuff to dig into yet. We're just seeing the very early beginnings of Max Pacioretty in Carolina. But are you taking anything away from the first six minutes and eight, and eight seconds of Max Pacioretty's stint as a hurricane? or And then beyond that, what do you think we're expecting from him as a hurricane versus what he did in Vegas? Of course, last season, 78-point pace. Season before, 87-point pace. Season before, 76-point pace. We've talked about how on the show he like really reinvented himself as like this... Uh, like a, a really high quality shooter in a way that he had never quite been in his career, even though he'd always been pretty dangerous. He really upped it in Vegas. So yeah, what are you thinking about Max Pacioretty in Carolina? I mean, it may take a couple games for him to get up to speed, but I am fully expecting the same player we had in Vegas. Uh, he's now up to four shots and a hit today. And this is just in just under two periods. Uh, he did start on the fourth line technically, Rod Brindamore said he would play with a lot of people, so it may be easing him back in for a couple games, but if for some reason he's on your waiver wire, please pause the podcast and go grab him. <laughs> I dropped Max Pacioretty when? Like two months ago in a league that did not have enough IR spots. Maybe it was three months ago. I carried him long enough. It was a season-long points league. And I was like, okay, all right, it time's up. And I don't even know if this guy's going to play this year. And then, of course, sure enough, uh, someone else beat me to the punch to grab him. So, yeah, go out, pause the pod, make sure Max Pacioretty is not available in free agency any longer than he needs to be, which is basically the, the amount of time it takes you to go get him. I mean, that fourth shot, Jeremy, it, since the time that it took me to introduce him, is like a huge, huge boon already. 
Uh, I guess the one concern in Carolina is that they have a really even distribution of their offense. Like they really like to roll their their top nine versus the way Vegas was sort of treating Pacioretty's line as the like with Pacioretty in Vegas. Uh, that second line of Carlson, Riley Smith, and Marshall, so, like we're not even fantasy relevant. So when you look at Pacioretty having been an 80, on average, 80 point pace player the last few seasons, do you think, in, in your opinion, are you still valuing him with that same upside in Carolina? I do think he has the same upside. I think it's highly dependent on that power play one slot. There is some danger that Carolina decides to balance the power plays and he doesn't get power play one time. But then again, the last two years in Vegas, he only had 61 and 56%. So it may be kind of similar if he bounces around between the top two units. I do think that he will certainly play power play one over Nason when Nason, who just got injured, is back and over Taravainen. So it seems like it should be all aboard and he's got arguably just as good playmakers with him as he did in Vegas. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And so far, uh, playing with, well, playing with Derek Stepan and Kaniemi at even strength is is a little different than Eichel and Stone, but we'll see. I mean, we see Carolina blend their lines often enough. I think that top power play spot is definitely like a, a key for him. And it's really unfortunate for anyone who has like Tavo Teravine and still hanging on. Maybe he'll get that top power play now that Nason's injured. Uh, well, it wasn't him. It was Seth Jarvis. Now it's not even Seth Jarvis. So now Teravainen is probably two spots in line behind Stefan Nason, who I'm curious to see what happens on that top power play when Nason's healthy, because Nason played net front on the unit. And that's not the role that Pacioretty has played in Vegas. The last couple of years, he played more on the flanks. That's where he took his shots from. So we'll see if Carolina is so determined to be like, yes, Stefan Nason, net front specialist. We want him there, even if it means Pacioretty gets bumped to the second power play unit, which would then put uh, Jarvis... Tara Vinen and Pacioretty all on the second unit. I mean, there's not really a great fourth or fifth piece there, but it probably makes that second unit at least a titch more dangerous, but there's still the second unit. I, there's no there's no rose-colored outlook here for Tavo Tara Vinen or Seth Jarvis, really, who are getting boxed out. And we'll see if Stefan Nason works his way back up to the top power play when he's healthy. I'm not sure he will. It's kind of crazy to think that he can take a spot from Max Pacioretty on the top power play, but you could have said that about a couple of these other guys on the Canes roster. So I I can't wait to find out. It's going to be spicy when it happens. Um, so uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's where things stand in Carolina right now. Jeremy, did you have one more thing you wanted to add? I did, uh, because nobody really understands the inner workings of Rod Brindamore's mind. Uh, we've seen guys like Andrei Svechnikov get bumped to power play too also. And that's the position that Pacioretty would also play on the power play. I would be a little bit nervous as a Svechnikov owner, especially since he has, quote unquote, the chemistry with some of those other players, that if Nason comes back, maybe he's the one who gets bumped. Not a reason to really sell right now, but definitely in the back of my mind. For sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good thing to keep in mind. And also, by the way, for anyone, we had a question on our Discord server that I think I should share. You know, it's pa- it's it's the Patch Ready Show. All right, we're going to keep going on that for just another minute. We had a question on our Discord server for our patrons where uh, someone was like, I have Patch Ready stashed, but I could probably use another right winger. And can I use him as trade bait? Like, how should I do this? And so Elon and I threw out a couple targets. And the idea was, you know, maybe Pacioretty won't be quite as good as he was in Vegas. So take what he did last year and look for someone performing, like, just a little under that and see if you can get them back. So, like, Elon suggested Patrick Kane as maybe a, an interesting trade target. Troy Terry, Cole Caulfield. I threw out, um, like, Martin Natchez or Jake, Drake Batherson. Um if you wanted to really go for it, although I, I don't think it's likely, but you could see if a cold Chris Kreider might be attainable for you for Max Pacioretty, even though Pacioretty could end up being better, you know, coming back from injury on a new team, those are two red flags that you just want to be a little cautious about if you're thinking of trying to ride Pacioretty uh, through the rest of the season, or if you're looking to buy low on him. Just just keep in mind, this is not necessarily guaranteed to be a smooth ride for Pacioretty. Let's talk about another return from injury. Over in New Jersey, we have Andre Palat, 
who is finally back in the lineup. Man, it's been a while since Palat was injured. Uh, he was injured back on October 24th. Uh, he's played, what, six games this season? Uh, the, tonight, he's playing his seventh. He wasn't remarkable in those six games. Just three goals on, uh, well, 10 shots, and that actually includes two tonight. So three goals on eight shots, no assists. He was on the top power play for the very first game, but since then, Andre Palat has been on the second unit, including so far it looks like that's the way it's shaking out tonight. Playing on the line with Nico Heeshear and Jesper Bratt at five on five. Jeremy, do you have any interest in trying to hurry up and get Andre Palat before anybody else catches wind that he's returned. Because it's like it's not a high-profile return to the lineup, so you might be able to sneak him onto your roster if you could, Jeremy, would you? I'm probably taking a wait-and-see approach and not particularly interested in Palat. No matter how good the Devils have been this year, his line mates still won't be better than the line mates he had last year, which were Braden Point and Nikita Kucherov for significant potions this season. If Palat had value in your league last year, maybe you want to look at him. But he was a fringe guy in a lot of my leagues last year, even. And also, he's not playing on PP1 currently. And I believe another guy on the Devils who is nearing return is Nathan Bastian, who for some reason plays on Power Play 1 when he's healthy. So I don't think Palat will get up there at any time soon. Nathan Bastian, the Stefan Nason of New Jersey. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. On Palat, Jeremy, like he has had some really good even strength line mates. And a couple seasons ago, in 2021, when Palat had that 70 point pace, he did that because he replaced Kucherov on the top power play and he feasted there. 20 power play points in 55 games. But his five on five production, even in really good situations, Palat has always sort of been a, a pedestrian five on five producer. So without being part, uh, like a crucial part of a top power play unit, it, it is hard to see Andre Palat being terribly relevant. And also, he never really even gets two shots per game on average. So that's another reason to think he's not somebody who's going to be able to do a whole lot for your fantasy roster. Just quickly with his return, uh, so mentioned Palat, Hishier, and Brat are together, which means Jack Hughes is playing with Tatar and Eric Haula and uh, Dawson Mercer and Igor Sharankovich basically fall to the fourth line. Uh, Eric Halla is at least worth a, a quick mention. I actually added him in the cupful uh, to get his points both on Wednesday and Thursday. He's got a four-game point streak going, uh, four all assists, and he's had uh, four shots over his last two games, and uh, and that's counting. That's with tonight's game still in progress. So, you know, anyone, anytime someone's playing with Jack Hughes, uh, he's pretty interesting. Although we've seen Mercer and Halla and Tatar all be there and not do a whole lot. Jeremy, if you had to pick a New Jersey forward not named Heeshear or Hughes to add to your lineup, who would it be? So I'm assuming I can't pick Jesper Brat. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Also not named Jesper Brat. He's not allowed. Uh, I think I would still go with. Uh, Andre Palat. Uh, I'm not really interested in any of those guys, so I can't say I've dug too far in. I think they're all kind of in that streamer territory where you add them. I'd add any of them for a back-to-back like yesterday and today, and then probably drop them as soon as that's over. Yeah, you would hope that Tatar could be worthwhile. Like he's top line, top power play is four shots already tonight against St. Louis, but that is more in 11 minutes than he put together in his four previous games combined, even though he had three points, all assists in those games. He's just, he could be a really frustrating guy, even with top notch deployment. So Tomas Tatar gets a, an honorable mention here, but, and you like Palad. And honestly, I think I might go Eric Halla just because at least he's shooting. So uh, this is all to say that everybody in New Jersey is, is pretty, pretty horizontal. Once you get past the big three forwards there. Uh, Speaking of big three forwards, let's go to another team that features them, or at least has in the past. Uh, And they are all healthy. Jack Eichel is back in the Vegas lineup, or at least he's supposed to be back. Game time is in an hour. Uh, I believe the last thing I saw about him was that he's he's back. I don't know that, you know, I don't know warmups have happened yet. It's not 100% confirmed, but he was practicing um on oh my gosh i did not check this okay 
Uh, Jack Eichel is practicing on a line. I don't even know what line this is. With uh, Nicholas Roy, or Nicolas Roy, depending on where you're from, and Riley Smith. Um, Top power play, too. But, Jeremy, does this, uh, does this concern you at all? That Jack Eichel is not just jumping back up with Chandler Stevenson and Mark Stone. Actually, Mike Amadio is still there. As of yesterday's practice, I don't know. We'll have to see how things shake out. But what are you expecting to see from Eichel now that he's back into game shape? I'm not too concerned. I think they're probably rewarding Mike Amadio for some really good play. Uh, Amadio's still a younger guy with some potential to grow. So, you know, they probably want to keep that line together while it's hot. And they're leaning very heavily into their top nine thing that we've seen them do before. Sure, it's not the greatest Steven strength line mates, but he's up on the power play. He's, Eichel this is, is up on the power play and a talent of his own. So I'm not too worried if he's on the first line or the third line. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I'm not that concerned and it's probably not long. Like he, Stevenson and Stone were doing so well. Of course, Amadio, Stevenson and Stone have also been doing pretty well lately as well. Uh... Yeah, I'm looking back towards to the lines at the start of the season for Vegas. And of course, Eichel started the year. Stone was injured. Eichel started the year with Riley Smith and Phil Kessel and then was reunited with a healthy Mark Stone and Chandler Stevenson. They've been together ever since. So I guess I'm not that concerned. And maybe the takeaway here, which you've already mentioned, Jeremy, is like maybe this is a little reward for Mike Amadio and maybe he gets a little longer of a look. Like I, I know in some leagues I'm in, I saw him dropped when the news about Eichel returning came out. And I'm sure whoever dropped him is like, oh, I probably should have hung on uh, just just a little longer, at least. I'm looking at his most recent. Yeah, he's on, uh, what's he on now? A seven-game point streak, including five goals for Amadio. So it does seem like it might be tough to uh, to to move him off that top line until until he goes cold, right? Yeah, you'd think so. And I mean, I think this is a classic hot streak. He's not shooting enough to actually sustain that five goals in seven games. He already got dropped off of power play one where he had been subbing in for a bit. But hey, hold him while he's hot. I'm sure the team will uh, bump him down when he cools off too. Yeah, great advice. Hold Amadio until you see him off the top line and cool. And in the meantime, still act like if you have Amadio and you need to activate Eichel and your drop is Amadio, I think you still do it. Like don't don't prioritize Amadio over Michael, especially uh, sorry over Eichel. Oh, that's confusing. Uh, especially with Eichel on the top power play, safely stowed there. Okay, uh, so yeah, I, I hope for great things the rest of the season for Eichel he's been out uh, like it, it feels like a long time for those of us who have him on their fantasy teams it's just been about a month so uh we'll see he was he was doing just fine before he left and I hope he will come back and do just fine when he comes back he's on an almost 90 point pace this season uh and it looks like pretty great power play point every three games or so keep it up jack i hope he picks up right where he left off uh speaking of some people who are going to be leaving off and we hope they'll pick back up when they do return a couple injuries to report let's start over in boston where the big news was that dave uh jake debrusque sorry to give anybody a, a moment who has david pasternak it's not david pasternak it's jake debrusque who's injured. Apparently he scored twice on a fractured fibula uh, and without like his coach didn't even know about it. You know, classic hockey story, of course. And then uh, apparently it's also a hand thing too going on for Debrusque. So he's out for a little while, at least a month, which is a, a huge hit to anybody who's found Debrusque this season. He's someone that I had basically sworn off because of his paltry performances, even with great opportunities in past years but he I guess he never really had the coach's faith and confidence which is what he has now in Boston from Jim Montgomery DeBrusque is now on a 68 point pace 16 goals 14 assists for 30 points in 36 games including 11 power play points so he's pacing for about 25 power play points for the year which is huge and a great way to to do well with top unit power play time consistently for 
the first, maybe the second time in his career. In his sophomore season, he had a bunch of top unit time. But this is this is great for DeBrusque. He's taken full advantage. He's shooting more. He's scoring more. I think he might even be hitting more. So this hurts for anybody who loses him. Um, Jeremy, this leaves, of course, a big hole on the top line and top power play in Boston. Do you have any thoughts on on what to do with the other pieces that are at play here? Well, I think pretty much everybody in Boston's top six probably is already held. Uh, the one guy who seems to be getting a major boost from this, though, is Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall had been on the third line, uh, a third line that had been clicking very well, no doubt. But now he's playing on the second line with Krejci and Zaka. But he also took DeBrusque's power play one spot, which, you know, in Boston, that's worth a lot because they run that unit a lot. Right, so that's a huge, huge bump for Taylor Hall, who has been playing, as we mentioned on the last show, line three, power play two. Now, I mean, we'll see exactly where he lands at five on five. I'm seeing from Bruins practice lines on Wednesday that Hall was practicing on the second line with Krejci and Pavel Zaka, who also becomes kind of an interesting player to consider uh, if he's playing with vintage Taylor Hall, who I assume is buried somewhere within Taylor Hall right now and maybe gets called upon a little bit more. But remember, like David Krejci has always been a super great player, but he's never been able to do much because that Marshawn Bergeron Pasternak line basically takes care of all the offense and many of the minutes. So Hall, Krejci, and Zaka still might have limited opportunities to produce, but it makes Zaka a little more rosterable. Hall, for what it's worth, had five shots in his last game against uh, Pittsburgh. I guess, was that the, uh, that was the outdoor game, I think. Yeah, he, pick, he picked up an assist. And um, I mean, uh, if Hall has been dropped, now's the time to reconsider going back to get him. And he very well might be available in your league because uh, before this last game, he had a five-game point drought that was followed by an actual really great period of production, much of it coming from the third line mysteriously. And as we've said on the show, I didn't really believe in it. Anyway, good news for Taylor Hall, sort of good news for Pavel Zaka, and uh, Jake DeBrusk, hopefully, will be able to pick up where he le- left off in about a month's time, roughly. Uh, a couple more quick injuries that we don't have a ton of information on. How about Patrick Kane over in Chicago? He had a, what the team called a maintenance day today. He didn't practice. He left mid-game. Ben Pope, uh, one of the beat writers in Chicago, mentioned that Patrick Kane is still a maybe for Friday night against Arizona. And that everything will depend on how he feels in the morning. So, like, this is just a short-term thing. Uh, Jeremy, are there any takeaways at all from Patrick Kane being injured here? Do we just like, oh yeah, he's injured. Uh, good to know. Move on. He's injured. Nothing else. I assume he's going to be back soon, but kind of sucks that he's still in Chicago right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's the takeaway. The takeaway is it's bad to be in Chicago. It's worse to be injured in Chicago. Uh, one guy who is still healthy in the lineup and capable of scoring, by the way, Seth Jones. Remember someone who I said you might want to buy low on or try buying low on? He rewarded me for that take in the next game against Tampa. He picked up a goal uh, against, uh, yeah, against, well, against Brian Elliott, which we can get into. A goal in four shots. It was on the power play. So a nice, uh, nice tidy outing from Seth Jones and anybody wondering if he could come back. But speaking of Brian Elliott, he played a couple games in a row, which had everybody, uh, raising their eyebrows about why exactly this was happening. It's been a long time since Brian Elliott uh, started two in a row, except wasn't there, Jeremy, can you remember, wasn't there a situation like two or three years ago where Vasilevsky didn't start either end of a back-to-back in like a key fantasy hockey week? I think it did happen a couple years ago, like because Tampa was so good and locked into a, a playoff spot and decided that resting their studs included Vasilevsky and just didn't play him on like a Sunday. I think that caused some chaos in some of my leagues. Yeah, so there was chaos, and especially because the Tampa Bay Team Twitter account like actually tweeted out lineups with Vasilevsky in them, and then like beat writers were like, 
no, we saw Elliot. It's going to be Elliot. And then it was like some crazy back and forth. And it ended up being Brian Elliot, who uh, subsequently lost to Minnesota, giving up four goals on 32 shots after having a successful game against Chicago the night before, uh, only letting in that goal by Seth Jones, of course. So um, a rare, like, you know, usually Brian Elliott sees two games over the course of, I don't know, a week or two. He, he's been playing a little more often lately. He used to see a start every couple weeks, but over the last uh, month or so, Brian Elliott's been getting a game in on average every week, which is still not very much, but it's more than he saw before. But whatever, this isn't so fancy relevant. Uh, Andre Vasilevsky, so long as he's healthy, you want him. And even if Brian Elliott, like, it's Brian Elliott, but he's actually been having a, a pretty decent run lately. Like overall, his save percentage is an 897, but he has a three out of his five last starts have been very good. 944, 916, 962 amongst some two other duds, of course, because that's the Brian Elliott way. But of course, a great chance for a win. Anytime you can get a start from a Tampa starter. Another goalie injury we have is in Minnesota. Uh, Philip Gustafson, who... I, I, I don't know. I saw when I was watching the tweets roll in live that, oh, it was his hand issue. He's had a hard time recovering from like this this sort of recurring thing. And he left. Maybe it was precautionary. Maybe it wasn't. The next tweet I saw is that he was seen vomiting after the game. And my thought was like, oh, my gosh, the pain must have been really bad. But, Jeremy, you think that he was just sick. Yeah, it sounds like I saw some other tweets and it's from the beat writers saying that they think he was just sick and he may be ready for this weekend. So if you grabbed him for the potential to get Thursday's or Wednesday's game and the back-to-back, I'd hold on. And especially since you can put him in your IR, hope that he gets the Sunday game. Yeah. And there's a good chance of that. Like Philip Gustafson is playing like fairly regularly these days and mounting a, a decent challenge to Mark andre Fleury over the season. Gustafson's actually been like a far better goalie uh 85 save points above expected versus flurry who is 54 save points below uh that's a pretty big difference gustafson has seen somewhat better protection but that still does not account for the huge difference in their five on five play and this is the philip gustafson that uh, pittsburgh traded to ottawa um, as like a, a highly sought after prospect. It was a great trade ship at the time. And then Ottawa thought Gustafson might be their goalie of the future. Never really developed in the organization. But now he's uh, he's getting back on track here in Minnesota. Of course, those were season long numbers that I quoted. And Marc-Andre Fleury has also been uh, much more on his game. In fact, Minnesota, a team that could not by a good goalie game at the start of the season has been getting stellar goaltending lately, which has uh, helped the whole team. Like Gustafson, I'm looking at his record uh, in his last, what is this, nine decisions. He's got eight wins and a 941 save percentage, which is a, an amazing way to sort of break in. And he's in a fantastic position to take the torch from Marc-Andre Fleury at some point. So, Maybe this is a good moment. Uh, I mean, it's probably a little late, but in a keeper or dynasty format, if you can take a look at Philip Gustafson as being a starter on a team that could be good for a little while yet, uh, then you might enjoy what you get from Philip Gustafson. Um, Jeremy, who would you prefer next year in Minnesota between Marc-Andre Fleury and Philip Gustafson? Absolutely, Philip Gustafson. I mean, I forget what Fleury's contract situation is, but they've already basically been alternating starts this year, and Gustafson doing better with them. It's starting to feel like, uh, not clearly not in talent level, but it's feeling a bit like Sorokin and Halak a couple years ago, where every year Sorokin took more and more percentage of the starts until he was a true starter. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good comp. So so Fleury has one more year on his contract next year, and I think I'm with you. Um, he will be how old next year? He'll be 39 years old next year, which is like almost Craig Anderson old, which means I could see him, you know, moving into that vet role, especially if Gustafsson keeps proving himself as somebody we can rely on. All right, and then uh, quickly to Pittsburgh, Tristan Jari, no news here, no, no questions to ask. He stayed in Pittsburgh, so Casey DeSmith likely gets both starts for the road trip, and anybody who was listening to the last episode of Short Shifts, Jeremy, already heard your take, which is that Pittsburgh doesn't have a fantastic schedule coming up. So even if you get Jari's two starts this week, uh, they have a ba- the Pens have a back-to-back 
next week and only three games played. So you might only get two more games out of him over the course of a week. And maybe you might find a better use for that roster spot. Uh, You know, that's like basically two free weeks for Jari to heal where DeSmith doesn't get to see a whole lot of action. Speaking of a whole lot of action, we've had a whole lot of action so far on short shifts. Uh, Why don't we take a little bit of a break, come back after it, hear about uh, players re-arriving in Winnipeg, a player emerging in Anaheim. I'll just name them. McTavish, Byfield, Niederreiter, Vrana, Huso. Uh, Huso. Huso's not that exciting, but all of these guys we're going to talk about after the break. You are listening to Short Shifts. Welcome back to Short Shifts. I hope you didn't go very far because Jeremy and I are ready to keep rolling. Jeremy Versillo, of course, in for one of the two Short Shifts co-hosts. You take your pick. I'm in for the other one. I'm Brian Com, and very happy to be here with you as we roll through the latest and greatest news and notes that have happened in the NHL this week so that you can exploit them for your fantasy success. Let's uh, head over to some outjuries over in Winnipeg now where Blake Wheeler, I know I'm going to mess this up, Blake Wheeler and Nick Ehlers have both returned to the lineup. The return of Wheelers uh, in Winnipeg, which is basically, yeah, it's a third of the top six there. Ehlers has been gone a long, long time. It's been a a lengthy, mucky kind of situation for him since he was injured. It's like when he was injured, there wasn't a whole lot of information. And I was like, yeah, he might be out. And this is after the second game of the season. Yeah, he might be out a while. Yeah, he's not really skating. Okay, we're working on it. No timeline in sight. Finally, three months later, Nick Ehlers looks poised to return to the lineup after basically he hasn't played this year. He played twice, picked up three points and seven shots, which was great. But I have him in a season-long points league, and uh, I need him back healthy and playing. So he's coming back. Blake Wheeler, who's also had a pretty surprising uh, well, I don't know if it's totally fair to call it surprising, but he's had a better season than I would have expected so far. Blake Wheeler on a 74-point pace, which is basically the same point pace as Wheeler has had for the last three seasons, except he's 36 years old this season, so I, I felt it was a little bit surprising. And his power play deployment did dip. Um, but anyway, they're both back. Jeremy, what have you seen about where Ehlers and Wheeler are slotting into the lineup, and what do you feel like you can expect from them? Well, it looks like they're both slotting into the top six, with Wheeler on line one with Shifley and Perfetti, and Ehlers on line two with Dubois and Connor. Uh, It does look like, though, that Nikolai Ehlers is the one on power play one. And if you remember from the past, that's always been a frustration that he plays on power play two at a at one point, it was even he wants to play on power play, too. So, oh, I remember that. Yeah. That was so annoying. I was like, yeah, let him be the guy. on, But he won't be the guy on power play one. He's better suited being the guy on... That was nonsense. I didn't like that. Yeah, well, it looks like you may get to see him on power play one when he comes back. Uh, the last tweet I saw is that they were both awaiting final medical clearance, but very well could both play tomorrow. Uh, and then I saw that Winnipeg waved Mikey Icemont who was one of the guys that was filling in. So he's probably going back to the AHL and at least one of them will have a roster spot tomorrow. Yeah, let's hope so. I mean, Winnipeg's really slow playing the return of Wheeler and Ehlers, both in recovering from injury and also in actually getting back into the lineup. But hopefully we'll see a healthy Wheeler and Ehlers. Both, of course, like not much actionable fantasy advice here. I guess if somebody dropped Wheeler because they didn't have IR space, I'd, I'd go get him. He's been really streaky. This year, he was basically doing nothing until he went on a wild tear for about a month from November to December. It wasn't even a month. It was like three weeks where he's put up basically like three quarters of his full season's production in about a 10 or 12 game span out of the 29 he's played. So we'll see which Blake Wheeler shows up returning from injury, but I would at least go grab him if he's available, uh, if someone someone dropped him because he was injured. And of course, Ehlers, I just, I would love, oh, I would love for him to be on the top power play unit. Uh, Somebody else who's getting an unusual boost that we've been waiting for to get a boost is over in Anaheim, Mason McTavish, Finally, he has guys to play with, and he responded against Dallas on Wednesday with a goal and an assist, four shots, three blocks, six face-off wins uh, to date. Mason McTavish, Jeremy, can you even name, well, you see my notes, 
Could you have named, or dear listener, could you name who Mason McTavish's most common line mate has been this season? I don't think I can. I mean, I'm, I know he's been playing on the third line a lot and has been uh, playing a lot of minutes, at least. But I don't know who his number one line mate was. Brett Leeson. Yeah, Brett Leeson, Calgary's own. He's 23 years old. Uh, he's never been in an offensive role since leaving the WHL. Uh, he has 10 points in 69 NHL games in his career. He's not an exciting player, but this is not about who TF is Brett Leeson. This is about Mason McTavish escaping Brett Leeson and Max Jones and Frank Vitrano and Maxime Comtois and finally having two NHL caliber wingers with him. And that's Adam Henrique and Troy Terry, which is a huge upgrade. So this begs the question, Jeremy, is this a pause the pod moment for going out and getting Mason McTavish now that he has talent to play with? Is he good enough to capitalize and be rosterable the rest of the way? I'm not sure if it's a pause the pod moment because the Ducks just are so bad at scoring, but he's certainly vaulted himself into the conversation as one of the three most interesting Ducks on the waiver wire. One of the three most, uh, a ringing endorsement. (laughs) Wait, on the waiver wire, not even like period. So you're lumping him in. Who are the other two most interesting waiver wire Ducks? Are they Henrique? And Vitrano? Yeah, I was lumping in with the other two top sixers, Henrik and Vitrano, who, again, can score. I think Big Tavis shoots a lot. He hits a lot. But he's also very young and on a bad team. So there's going to be some good games and some bad games. Yeah, he's only been averaging, what, uh, less than 12 minutes of five-on-five ice time per game. And then what did he see? Uh, I actually don't have this up. How many minutes did he see on that? first line turn that he had uh mason mctavish frozen tools game log 16 minutes and 20 seconds of ice um which is actually less than the game before and very much in line with what he's been seeing so i guess not a whole lot more minutes but hey those are if the quantity isn't there the quality sure is i'd at least go go grab him uh if you have a space if you're looking for a streamer and then see what happens over the next couple games. Although, Jeremy, your point is very well taken. Anaheim uh, is only the 20, I'm doing the math in my head, the 30th ranked team in the league in expected goals per 60 minutes at five on five. Can you guess the two teams they're ahead of? The only two teams that are less likely to score a goal than the Anaheim Ducks. I am quite surprised that Anaheim is ahead of two teams, but I would guess that they are Chicago and Montreal. Oh, good guess. Chicago's 32. Montreal's a little bit ahead of Anaheim. It's actually Arizona sandwiched between Chicago and Anaheim, who we mentioned has been on like a shooting percentage bender for a season and a half now, while being one of the worst, at least statistically, analytically offensive teams of the last little bit. Uh, So that is the caveat with Mason McTavish. But hey, maybe Mason McTavish's line can be productive or at least dangerous when they're on the ice together. And then everybody else can be the ones responsible for pulling Anaheim back down to 30th in the league and expected goals. Another player who has seen an ascension to the top line, who we've been waiting to see a little more from for a while over in LA, it's Quinton Byfield, who has played four times since being called up from the AHL. If you don't remember, Byfield was sent down earlier this season to, uh, I guess, fine-tune his game with Ontario of the AHL, maybe rebuild his confidence. He had played uh, eight games before being sent down, had just three assists, and was seeing, like, third, fourth line, definitely bottom six minutes, barely shooting at all. He actually just had five shots over the eight games that Byfield had played. Uh, No power play role in that either. He went down to Ontario. He put up 15 points, nine goals and six assists in 16 games in the AHL and pops back up with the Kings right back in that fourth line spot for his first two games, playing just nine minutes a night and taking zero shots in both those nights. But then on New Year's Eve, a little New Year's present, for Quinton Byfield, which is that he ends up on the top line alongside Kopitar and Kempe. In two games there, Byfield has a single assist and two shots, playing about 15 minutes a night. So still nothing terribly exciting here, Jeremy. How are you feeling about a Byfield versus 
say a McTavish? Are you any more interested in, in one over the other? I think for this year, I'm more interested in McTavish. Uh, he's been up the whole year. He's been playing, I think he's averaging close to 15 minutes a night, as opposed to where Byfield was playing much less when he was on the third and fourth lines. And I think they're both going to get subjected to the line runs for a lot, as young guys often are. But in Dynasty or Keeper Leagues, I would be making sure that I have stakes in both of these players because they will be very good NHL players in the near future. Absolutely. Yeah, the question for Byfield, well, I was going to say it's not if, it's when. But then we look to Lafreniere and Kako and it's like, well, the when is turning into an if. And from what we've seen from Byfield so far, it's not that exciting. The thought has always been, well, he's got to wait until like Kopitar is going to age out. And as he ages out, whatever he gives up from his role will land with Byfield and Byfield will be able to take it and run. But we just, uh, there's just not a whole lot to sink your teeth into with Byfield there. So yeah, in a dynasty league, Jeremy, I like that advice. Go for it. Uh, This might be a quiet time. And at least this is a window that LA says, hey, like we see this guy, we we gave him some time to develop. We're going to try and do this right. And we eventually, I, I take this as a sign that they eventually see Byfield being a top line player, but you might still be able to buy lower on him now than you might be able to in uh you know a couple years from now i'd still much rather have mctavish at the moment at least he does anything like shoots for starters and i think he he might be more of a threat to point as well okay how about a uh, byfield versus a player that elon called hot in nashville that's Nino Niederreiter, who I, Elon, I kind of quibble with this. Uh, by the way, thank you, Elon. Elon helped prep the show tonight, which I'm eternally grateful for, uh, as I am always, everything he has to offer and all the shows. So way to go, Elon. Um, but yeah, Nino, Nino Niederreiter being hot means he has, uh, he had three assists against Montreal on Tuesday night. And aside from that, it's really, it's pretty quiet. Like he had a two game stretch where he had 10 shots but no points in those games before the three assists in Montreal. You know, hits a few times a night. He's playing with Granlund and Cody Glass in Nashville, which um, I, don't, I don't know, Jeremy. How do you feel about Nino Niederreiter ranked amongst Byfield and Mason McTavish? I'm easily taking Niederreiter over the two rookies. Uh, I think Elon's hot was coming from the fact that he has eight points in his last 10 games. So he is kind of breaking right. it up. The time on ice with Nino is always a problem. He seems to kind of not really play power play one and get pulled off uh, early, especially when uh, the game is close. But he has been consistent in what he's done. And I think he's valuable in certain types of leagues. Yeah, well, especially with those few hits a night and being like, you know, before the game against Montreal, Nita Ryder had five points in nine games. And that's probably about what I'd expect him to do uh, what I really saw when I actually looked at, I was like, okay, well, who's Nita Ryder playing with? Um, and I saw a mess in Nashville. I don't know if you know, but the lines have gone in the blender over for the Predators. Uh, and I have a couple of Preds in my lineup, and like I'm actually kind of sick of them. They're they're very inconsistent for me this year. I have Philip Forsberg and Matt Duchesne, and I've cycled through Granlin, Johansson, Parson in over the course of the season. Uh, if I still had Parson in, though, I'd have one of Philip Forsberg's current line mates. Uh, he's playing with Parson in and Colton Sissons, who um, I guess everybody's seeing some measure of success together right now, which is a bit of a surprise. Colton Sissons, I'd argue, is hotter than Nino Niederreiter. He's got four points in three games, two goals and two assists. However, only on three shots. Yusuf Parsonen has three points in his last three games. He never shoots, but he has 11 hits and he takes face off. So depending on your format, uh, if you're looking at a Nino Niederreiter, you might also want to take a peek at a Sissons and a Parsonen. And uh, I should also mention the other line is Matt Duchesne with Ryan Johansson and Mark Jankowski. Uh, and Mark Jankowski, I guess, is the name that would be new and being like, oh, is, is he doing well there? And the answer is no. Mark Jankowski is not doing much of anything on that line. I'm actually, I'm just loading up the Nashville box score now from the game tonight with Carolina. Oh, so there's Forsberg from Parson and Roman Yosi. Parson with an assist on a Matias Ekholm goal. Cody Glass, of course, from Mikhail Grenland and Alexandra Carrier. And Mark freaking Jankowski from Ryan Johansson and Matt Duchesne. Everyone, everyone in Nashville scoring. This is very rare, but everyone in Nashville is scoring tonight. And Parsonen's assist 
on the Forsberg goal, by the way, was on the top power play. Okay, Jeremy, so I've named basically the entire Predators lineup. Do you have any takeaways from this? I guess if you had to rank like Niederreiter, Sissons, Parsonin, Jankowski, Ryan Johansson, Mikhail Granlund, their names would suggest they're above that list, but I, I wouldn't actually think that they're very far above that group. Do any of these guys stand out to you as somebody you are hoping to target? I believe, I'm going to have to double check this while you talk, but I believe Nashville has a four game week coming up. So is there anybody you would be interested in adding from the Predators given the current state of their lines and the production coming from all of them? And yeah, four game week next week, including a Monday-Wednesday start to the week, followed by Thursday and Saturday games. Honestly, if it's not Philip Forsberg or Roman Yossi, I'm just kind of rolling the dice and taking whichever pred is available on the wire. I think any of them can have big nights. Uh, Nashville deploys such a balanced attack, and even more so with this most recent iteration of the lines. I mean, Mikhail Granlin is technically on their fourth line right now, but he has a point tonight, and he's Miguel Granlund, so he's probably better than some of the guys playing top six minutes. So I don't know what to do here. They're uh, you got to get them for the four game week, but your guess is as good as mine as to which one's going to be most valuable. I I know exactly the spot you're in because this is where I end up usually hosting co-hosting the show with Elon. He names a bunch of guys, and I'm like, yeah. None of them really appeal. I will say, like you left off Matt Duchesne, and while his season has been overall disappointing, 66-point pace, which we were hoping for something around a point per game, so it's still a good season. Uh, It's still like the second or third best season in recent memory from him. It's just not quite up to the standard that we were hoping for from Duchesne this year. But he has, with with a point tonight, Duchesne has points in eight of his last nine. So I'd like to hope... He's heating up, but playing, I don't know, with Mark Jankowski and Ryan Johansson, I just feel like there's a ceiling on all these guys and what they can do. And I'm with you, Jeremy. Like, I feel most confident that Forsberg and Yosi are the guys who can make something happen on their own, regardless of who they're playing with, which is basically what everyone in Nashville is being asked to do. Um, I guess I'd take, I would take a look at any of them for Monday, Wednesday in a deep enough league as a, as a quick stream like you would, but I would not, uh, I would not have my hopes too high. Who are they playing Monday and Wednesday, Ottawa and Toronto, both on the road. I guess there is goal scoring potential there. So I don't know, something to keep an eye on. Um, Jeremy, let's end in Detroit, where last uh, on the last episode with Lewis, you were talking with him about where Jacob Vrana lands after being put on waivers and whether he would clear. And uh, the news is that Vrana did clear waivers. And I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, before I even put it to you, I have a bit of a, there's a lot of speculation about, you know, why would no team try? What does this say about Vrana? Why did the Red Wings just put him on waivers? How is, like, a lot of questions about why anyone's doing what they're doing. And I think maybe I'll just get up on my soapbox here for a minute and say, like, this is a player returning from, like, the a recovery program from the NHL with substance abuse. And as I'm watching, Canada's just scored the gold medal winning goal in overtime. What a game against Czechia, just to interrupt myself. Everybody who's listening knows, oh, those poor Czechs on the bench. Uh, they, they were down 2 nothing. They scored two goals in about two minutes. I just have the game on in the background. Uh, to make it somewhat as exciting as the 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 Sweden US game, by the way, how about that? That was a uh, that was wild. I was watching a, a highlight reel for it. They started the reel started with eleven minutes left in the third, and the score at five on five. I'm like, oh, okay, they're short on time. They've only got thirty seconds here. They're going to show the winning goal, and that's it. And no, it was like a full on highlight reel. What was the final score? Eight seven. Yeah, eight seven in overtime. It was a wild game. Yeah. With a great, uh, was it Chad Chad Lucius with a nice uh, tidy little move and over this three on three overtime for twenty minutes is is something. It's a, lot it's a of choice. Fun. Yeah, I think the NHL yeah. should do that in the regular season. I would love to see that. Do you know what the longest a game has gone in this three on three? Like it hasn't gone longer than ten minutes, has it? I, I don't know historically because I think they just moved to the format. Uh, they did a shootout after ten minutes in. Uh, the met in the uh, preliminary rounds. So I'm with you. Although, like, I think four on four would be good enough. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> for like a 20 minute overtime period. Uh, but it is fun to see it happen in extended moments. Uh, okay, I was on my soapbox though. Just about Jacob Vrana <laughs> coming back from a, from a recovery program, right? And maybe, just maybe, I don't know, like Steve Eiserman has a lot of a lot of rope with me. Like maybe he knew what he was doing. Maybe everybody knows what they're doing, which is giving the NHL probably a little more credit than they deserve based on everything we've seen over, well, forever. Uh, but maybe, just maybe, everybody knew, okay, Vrana is going to go get conditioned in the AHL. No one's going to touch. Like, this is what's best for his... I'm just guessing. But this is me giving, like, the benefit of the doubt to the player and team and league and just saying, this is this is a sensitive situation. Maybe we don't need to second guess the way that everything is playing out and just think that, yeah, maybe this is all agreed upon. Verona needs some time to get better. This is the best play. This is the best way for him to get going again and rejoin the team. And... No one is going to, you know, throw a wrench into those plans. Like, Anaheim's not going to claim him and ask him to, like, move teams and continue on his contract with a team that he never planned to. Anyway, this is just this is just a thought. I don't know if you have any any other thoughts to add or if that's uh, it's just the soapbox bit and we're done. Uh, no, I think you make a really good point from your soapbox that there's a human here underneath the hockey player and the fantasy asset. And it may just be one of those cases where either implicitly or explicitly teams decided that we're not, we're going to let him go through waivers because he needs some time to get himself right. And he wouldn't obviously be on waivers if everything was okay. Uh, The one, the one other thing I'll mention though, is that I believe only four teams had the cap space to claim him without making another move. And three of those four teams are tanking. So I kind of understand even if the uh, human aspect wasn't the reason, there's hockey reasons that a $5.25 million contract for a player who hasn't seen the ice in a couple months. Yeah, fair enough. So, uh, and it, so obviously it could be any number of things. And why, why spe- like, I just, I hope that his recovery goes well and that this is a good first step. And there's a million ways to read into it. But I, uh, yeah, thank you for, thank you for, for being my audience for this bit. Uh, how about one more fantasy relevant piece here that also is related to the miners in Detroit, where Alex and Delkovich is down uh, toiling with Grand Rapids right now. The Wings sent him down on a, I think it was officially called a conditioning stint with Grand Rapids. He's played a game there, 963 save percentage, stopped 26, I assume of 27 <laughs> shots uh, to to get that good game in picked up the win. Uh, So he did well there. He's got to be recalled within 14 days of being sent down. So it's not very long. And I don't know if in 14 days, what the Detroit goaltending situation is going to be that he's walking back into. Because Vili Husso, I sort of, uh, we mentioned him on the show a week or two ago on the uh, the mega show. I was just like, yeah, Husso's chugging along. Everything's fine in Detroit, but it's not. Who's just been bad lately? An 849 save percentage in his last five appearances. No quality start in that stretch. Who's came out strong out of the gate? And I think we've all, well, those of us who haven't been keeping close tabs on the Detroit goalie situation, at least know that Nadalkovic hasn't been a challenge. So it's like, well, I guess who's is doing well enough to hold the net, but barely in a lot of situations he'd be kicked out by now. Who's has an 885 save percentage in 17 games over the last Two months. His record is just a game above 500. He has only five quality starts in his last 17 games, which is, you know, a sub 33% quality start percentage, which is really freaking bad. Plus, Huso has six really bad starts, more, th- more than he has quality starts in those last 17 outings. So I don't know. Of course, uh, Elon's favorite, Magnus Helberg, is in the picture, but hasn't yet been seeing a greater volume of starts. Is he someone that might see a bunch in the coming days, at least while Detroit uh, has Nedeljkovic down in the minors, while they figure out exactly what they're going to do with their three goalies, none of whom they seem comfortable relying on? You know, I was originally going to make a jab at Detroit's defense, but while you were talking, I looked up the stats and Detroit is middle of the pack in expected goals against. So you could almost argue that if one of their goalies goes on a hot run, 
they're right back in the playoff picture because I think they're only a game or two out of it right now. Uh, maybe it is time for Magnus Helberg to get some run. I'd be surprised if that happens, given that he's more a journeyman than a future prospect. But something has to give if Huso continues to play this bad. And I do not envy the coaches in Detroit who have to make that decision right now. Yeah, for Huso's credit, uh, he has actually been all right at five on five. You know, I care a lot about five on five, right? Uh, at five on five, Ville Husso has actually been playing as well as Gustafsson and Marc-Andre Fleury have over the last month. We were just like extolling the virtues of it's just on the uh, shorthanded. Husso has been terrible. A 786 save percentage while shorthanded. His expected number his, is closer to 881. Uh, and that's making a huge difference in his overall numbers. Like, He's actually been really good for the last month. So maybe that's why the Red Wings aren't, you know, ready to jump and turn to Halberg. They seem like a pretty savvy organization. And, you know, if they're thinking the same way I am, that makes them pretty savvy, doesn't it? Uh, so maybe they see who's those five on five save percentage. They're not concerned. They don't feel the need to. But it would be nice if they did whip one of their other goalies into shape, Nadalkovich or Halberg, to take the mantle, if need be. But okay, that is going to do it for, well, I did an Elon. This is uh, this has turned into a long shift, Jeremy. Thank you so much for being here with me and sharing your insights. It was really great chatting with you about all that's happened uh, so far this week. Uh, you've done a great job subbing in on short shifts, and we really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, just a, a huge thanks, Jeremy, for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me again. I always enjoy the longer shifts. Uh, Don't tell my beer league teammates that. Well, they might not enjoy your longer shifts either, if we're being honest. (laughs) Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to us. Shout out to, uh, should I do my usual shout outs? I'll do my usual shout outs. Uh, Thanks to Kevin A. Bear, our cupful coordinator and our team of co-commissions. Thanks, Shams and uh, and Elon for all the work they do at keeping all the fancy relevant news rolling over at gamedaytweets.com. A little programming note is that uh, we are seeing uh, so long, farewell, but not like goodbye forever to Dave and the NHL stream scheme. The show is going on an indefinite hiatus. You can still follow Dave on Twitter at NHL Stream Scheme to see whatever he gets up to next. Uh, So in the meantime, we're working on maybe adding another show to the feed. Just keep an ear out to see what comes of that in the coming days. You might hear something this week or next week. In the meantime, you can definitely count on Elon and I returning for our mega show on Sunday where we will go uh, big and deep and long for all the big fancy news and trends over the last week. Uh, Thanks to Brand weave.com for our logo our, our outro music is by pat roach this episode was researched with help from dauber hockey frozen tools dauber prospects natural stature evolving hockey cap friendly the athletic hockey goalies.org hockey reference hockey viz hockey database elite prospects and yahoo jeremy before we go do you have any takes on you've watched a lot of the world juniors did, did you have any takes on who stood out to you that that's that's more exciting to you now after the tournament in keeper and dynasty formats than they were before Connor bedard is incredible like it's hard to say that he's more exciting but he kind of is like could be a crosby or mcdavid level prospect the most impressive player i thought was uh joshua Watt on canada i'm not sure if it's roy or Watt. he looked really strong it's kind of hard when you're playing for canada like everybody looks really strong one more player who impressed me was stanislav Sposo. He put up a lot of points for someone marketed as a defensive defenseman. Could be a good piece on Columbus's blue line sometime soon. All right. A lot of good young D uh, that we've seen in the tournament in Czechia and uh, Slovakia, too. Uh, anyway, thanks so much for being here with us. Until next time, play smart. Oh, also, thanks, Lewis, for helping prep the show and Ben for just like being part of the show. Uh, until next time, play smart and keep your shifts short. Which we definitely did not do, but this was good. <laughs>